Good morning, happy Sabbath. Welcome to this encounter with God and with your brothers and sisters. This past week has been a stressful week for the Laguna Niguel community. And uh, for many, the stress has not been relieved yet. I would like to encourage you to continue to keep your community in prayer, but also to be listening carefully, because sometimes it may seem that everybody is doing fine, nobody died, and because this is an affluent community, they should be doing fine. And yet, you never know. So please keep an eye out. Keep your ears open because you never know where the need is. And if the need is there, you and I are called to be there for those people in those difficult moments. How many of you like chicken soup? Chicken soup? Let me ask it differently. How many of you like chickenless chicken soup? Uh, you, you feel less guilty now? It's interesting that uh, children like chicken noodle soup. They say it's a comfort food. Even in hospitals, they use or in some hospitals, they use chicken noodle soup, not as a medicine, obviously, but there is this, at least myth, if not reality, of a chicken soup being a comfort food. You eat a chicken soup and you feel so good, and then you can move on. But then there is also chicken soup for the soul. In 1993, the first volume of Chicken Soup for the Soul appeared, written by uh, Jack Canfield and Mark uh, Hansen. When they wanted to publish that, that first volume of Chicken Soup for the Soul, no publisher wanted to print it. So after being refused by some major publishers, they went to Florida from New York, and there a self-help little publisher decided, all right, guys, let's publish this and we'll see. Well, guess what? It became a success, swiping success. And... Ever since, there has been a downpour of uh, all kind of chicken soups for all tastes and tempers. Chicken soup of all kinds. They say they have already published more than 275 volumes of chicken soups. And um, 5 million copies have been sold worldwide to the point where chicken soup for the soul has become a brand and uh, now they even sell pet food, chicken soup for the pet lover soul, that's what they call it. When I read the story, I said, that's crazy, chicken soup, and it all started with chicken soup? A bowl of chicken soup? Can I serve you a bowl of chicken soup this Sabbath morning? This bowl of chicken soup comes from the very first volume of chicken soup for the soul. It's about a little girl called Lisa that had a very serious illness. The only way her life 
could be saved and she could survive that sickness was a blood transfusion for, from her little brother, five-year-old little brother, George. And he could do that uh, transfusion because he had been through the same illness before and miraculously survived, and now he had some antibodies that his sister needed as a cure for her severe illness. So then the doctor sat down with uh, the little boy and explained to him the whole situation and then asked him, listen, would you give blood to your sister? And he said, uh, well, I'm not sure. But then after some hesitation, he said, well, I will give her blood so she will not die. Long story short, the transfusion takes place. And first, the little boy is all aglow. Then his face starts turning pale. Then all the smile from his face goes away. He turns to the doctor and asks him, am I going to start dying right away? Oh, right? And uh, from that question, you obviously know the little boy was misled. He thought he was going to give all his blood so his sister can live, but he will die. Chicken soup for the soul. But isn't that what the gospel is all about? Isn't the gospel about the incommensurable value of the self-sacrificing love of that innocent? Is it or not? Well, you may say yes. But actually, the gospel is much more than chicken soup soup. The gospel is so much more than chicken soup. Of course, the way the whole chicken soup for the soul started, those volumes should have contained real-life stories, true stories that serve as inspiration to anybody that reads them. But from that first bowl of chicken soup for the soul, that same story is now circulating in all different variants with all kind of little boys and little girls uh, playing different roles in it. And all those stories are beautiful and uh, they can satisfy our desires for something nice, for something beautiful, for something inspiring. But the value of those things is just that. Little bowl of chicken soup for the soul. The gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ is so much more than that. Because a chicken soup for the soul as good as it can be, misses some ingredients. Yes, there are some missing ingredients that make the whole difference. There are shortcomings, I would say even issues, in this chicken soup. But the gospel is much more than just chicken soup. Let us pray. Lord, we want to look at the gospel and uh, not only have comfort, 
but also transformation, radical change of our life in Jesus' name through the Holy Spirit. Amen. The first shortcoming of the chicken soup for the soul is that it does not really deal with that. Yes, death is somehow hinted upon. But in the chicken soup for the soul, neither the one that is ready to give up his life, nor the one for whom he is ready to give, give up his life, really die. When it comes to the gospel, real death is involved. You remember last time we spoke about uh, Paul's prayer for the believers in Ephesus, and one of his prayers, one component of it was so that they can know, they can see the power, chapter 1, verse 19. They can perceive the power, that exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. And as you can remember, we have Four different words in the Greek there designating the same concept of power. And I made my own translation, which says, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so that you will see, you will know the exceeding greatness of his power according to the power of the power of his power. What kind of power is that? Well, Verse 20 tells us that power is the one which he worked, that is, God worked in Christ when he raised him from where? See the difference? The little boy that gives his blood never actually dies. Here we are dealing with somebody that died. It, was just, it wasn't just a make-believe, a seemingly genuine death. It was real death. And the power which worked in Christ Jesus raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. And then starting with verse 1 in chapter 2, another element of death is brought into picture. And you, says the Apostle Paul, you, that is you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, Pastor Joe. Yes, and you, he made alive, who were what? See? The little girl for whom the little boy was ready to give up his life, she never actually died. In that story, it was just ch chicken soup for the soul. But here, death is involved. And you, who were dead in trespasses and sins, verse 2, in which you, again, once walked according. This is some sort of a dead walk. Because we were dead, but we walked according to the course or the age of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, verse 3, among whom also we all, says Paul, we all, those that now believe, probably some believers coming from among the Jews, with whom he identifies himself. We all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. And here we have to deal with a second shortcoming of the chicken soup for the soul. Because in that little story, as beautiful as it is, the diagnosis 
is not really given. We don't know what the sickness is. We don't know what the nature of that sickness is. We don't know how that little girl got into that critical condition. Here we know that we became dead in our trespasses, in our sins, because of being sons of disobedience or daughters of disobedience. You and I, we are coming from Mr. and Mrs. Disobedience. They are our parents. Disobedience. And yes, even our little children, they are sons and daughters of Mr. and Mrs. Disobedience. I'm not speaking about you, parents, or am I speaking about you? And as a reality, is the sinful nature of a human being. Some of you may not even remember now how it was, what it was like when you were still sons and, and daughters of disobedience. Because it has been so long ever since. But in reality, that's where we all start out. Before starting our journey of obedience to God, we have a segment, at least a short segment of our life, of disobedience. Therefore, the earlier a child can start the journey of obedience, the better because the harm is less. You know, I never really got involved in some of the big, sinful realities of this world. But I know one thing. My grandfathers, both, passed away early. One was 42, the other one 52, because of alcohol issues. I've never drunk, really. I never became drunk, well, with one exception. I was a child, and in our cellar under the house, we had must. You know what must is? It's uh, unfermented wine. The wine you drink and you never get drunk. But what happened is, this was late spring already. And in the meanwhile, without knowing, the wine in a demijohn downstairs got spoiled, got altered. And uh, as a child, I ran down there, took the hose, and... <laughs> few sips, and that was it. I ran on. And then later that day, I was feeling funny and somewhat happy. <laughs> then I went to sleep, and I woke up later all fine. But I'm just thinking, you know, where would I be today had it not been for him? Because I know even these inclinations can be inherited genetically. And I have been feeling that in my system. When I smell alcohol, when I see, you know, the Bible speaks about don't look, don't look at the wine, how it goes down. Yeah, I feel it. But I am in obedience to God. And now, disobedience, Mr. and Mrs. Disobedience, have been abandoned. And I have been adopted by Jesus Christ. The earlier the adoption, the better, because the harm is smaller. But then the text also says that we were by nature children of wrath. 
And if somebody may think this is wrath because the devil is angry and that's the devil's wrath, later on the same book of Ephesians in chapter 5 clarifies, it says in verse 5, for this you know that no fornicate or pornos, that's the word in Greek, unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Verse 6, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Well, I will not stop here entering and trying to clarify what that means, how the wrath of God and the sons of disobedience connect. We will see that later when we get to chapter 5. Because here the focus is not on that. Because everything that has been told up to this point about death and the diagnosis of disobedience has been told to us with a purpose in mind. What is it? Look at verse 4. But God, but God. And when you read, but God, you can read back everything you have found out up to this point. But God, we were dead, but God. We walked according to the course of this world, but God. We walked according to the prince of power of the air, but God. We were sons of dis disobedience, but God. We were by nature children of wrath, but God. But God what? What did God do? And now let's read the entire verse. But God, who is rich in mercy. Do you still know that God that is rich in mercy? Or you've uh, been given a God that is poor in mercy? But God who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loves us. What? Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Yes. And this brings us to a third shortcoming of uh, the chicken soup for the soul. Yes, death, diagnosis, or issues, but there's also some deception in the chicken soup for the soul because in that chicken soup, that little boy is deceived. He's misled to believe that he is supposed to give his blood, maybe all his blood, for his sister. But that is not the case. But that story puts parents in a very shady situation where you may ask, what kind of parent is that parent which would give up his little five-year-old to save the life of his or her somewhat older daughter. You see the challenge there? But when it comes to the gospel, the gospel is so much more than just chicken soup for the soul. Because in the gospel, God the Father, because of His richness of mercy, because of the love which we, with which He loved us, He gave for God so loved the world that He gave. Yes, that is all true. But at the same time, Jesus was not tricked into giving His life. He was not deceived or misled to give His life. No, He wanted. It was His desire to give His life. He actually asked for it. And there's a Bible verse in Hebrews chapter 2, Verse 9, 
where we are told that Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, he tasted death for everyone by the grace of God. Can you perceive what is going on here? Christ Jesus became the grace of God to us, or the undeserved gift of God to us, by the grace of God. In other words, He went to God the Father and asked the permission, if you want so, from God the Father to go and taste death for everyone. Therefore, by the grace of God, He became the grace of God. He was given the favor of going. He wanted, He had the desire of going and becoming the grace of God and taste death for each and every one. Now, that is remarkable, I believe, because from this recognition of what kind of love this is, how the dynamics of God's love, God the Father loving us with a rich mercy, and then Jesus Christ the Son becoming the grace of God, by the grace of God, to come and taste death for each one of us, when we realize what is happening, what they do, we may think, okay, so what is the result of this waste of love? Does this change the situation in any way? Well, and this is a fourth shortcoming of the chicken soup for the soul. We never know in the chicken soup for the soul if that little girl ever got cured or not. The story stops. So we don't knew, know the denouement of the whole story. The result. Is it actually happening? But in this story of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we know. And I put there something that you may be able now to recognize. You may not think that you will find the chiastic structure right in the letter to the Ephesians. But yes, this section from 1 to 10 in chapter 2 is in fact a chiasm. And you can see those parallel thoughts on one side and the other. But what is the center? By grace you have been what? Oh, so it actually happened. Unlike in the chicken soup for the soul, we don't know what happened there really. But here we know it did happen. By grace you have been saved. And look, before that, it says that we were made alive. We were dead, yes, we were dead. It was real dead. But we were made alive together with Christ. And then we were raised up and seated together with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Please also notice that at the beginning of that chiastic structure, you have walked, and then you have walked again at the end of it. We'll come back to that later. What I'm emphasizing here is that the gospel story is more than chicken soup for the soul, because it actually does work. Salvation really happens. And as a biblical concept, salvation is not just a, one day the good Lord will come back and snatch us and take us home and we are saved forevermore. No, no, no. As a biblical concept, salvation is synonymous with healing. Somebody that is saved is actually healed. We can read it this way, by grace you have been healed healed. Or the text also permits the translation, by grace you are being healed. Because salvation is not only about the future. 
Yes, it is about the future too. There will be a time when we will be sitting together with Jesus Christ at His right hand, if you will. But this passage says that we already have been raised up and seated together with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There is a reality that is already occurring, a reality that is happening already in Jesus Christ. Whatever kind of reality that is, we are already there sitting with Him. How is that happening? What kind of reality is that? And uh, yes, by grace we have been saved by grace, we have been healed. And then verse 7 tells us that in the ages to come, God wants to show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Can you imagine that reality? In the ages to come, say in the endless ages to come, God's intention is that He will do a show, a display of uh, His exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. When I, came, when I first came to the United States, that was in uh, Georgia, Atlanta, and uh, I was taken to Stone Mountain, I don't know if you know that area. There's a great, very interesting laser show. And uh, fireworks. And uh, everything you can imagine, bright and beautiful. Now, when you see that for the first time, you, you, you go like, wow, really? How can they even do this? This is how I imagine what God intends to do and that's why He has already seated us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, we already are experiencing that. But for the ages to come, He wants to do the display, the show of His exceeding riches of grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Because that's exactly that was challenged before everything went wrong. His grace, His character, His love was challenged. So His grace, the manifestation of His love in a sinful context will become a show, a display throughout the future, future ages so that everybody can understand the story of salvation what it means to save people from death, bring them back to life in Jesus Christ, see them there in Jesus Christ. And uh, now, when we are there, actually, physically, after Jesus' second coming, He can do a show showing us, like a trophy, of what grace has accomplished on this sinful earth. And then it goes out, it goes on explaining the whole device. It describes, it discloses how all this happens. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And you can also say true faithfulness. Because in the Bible, faith and faithfulness is the same thing. You have been saved through faith, through faithfulness, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And those two things have to be emphasized, not of yourselves. Is anybody here that believes he or she is saved 
of himself or herself? Are you saved of yourself? What is the answer to that? Uh uh, no. Not of works. Is anybody here that believes they are saved of their works? What is the answer to that? Uh uh, no, 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 no. So let me, let me then try to see what is happening here. In the Bible, faith, the concept of faith, emuna in the Old Testament and pistis in the New Testament, faith has three components. It is belief, trust, and faithfulness. So let me ask you, am I saved? Help me, help me understand this. Am I saved by my beliefs? Am I saved by my beliefs? If I am saved through faith, am I saved through my belief? No. Why not? Because it's not of yourselves. I know there are people that believe in salvation through doctrine, salvation through teaching, salvation through having the right ideas. No, no, no. The Bible doesn't teach that. That is false teaching. Then, let me take the other component, trust. Am I saved through, if I'm saved through faith, am I saved through my trust? Meaning, because I trust in God, in Jesus Christ, therefore I am saved. My trust, is that how I'm saved? The answer again is no, because it's not of yourselves. It's not of yourselves. But then, am I saved through my faithfulness? And to this, you may say, yes, through my faithfulness. But what is the sign of somebody's faithfulness? Isn't faithfulness expressed at the level of what you do or don't do? So isn't faithfulness something that results in works? Doesn't the text clearly say not of works? then am I saved through my own faithfulness? Am I or not? Am I saved through my faithfulness? Say yes or no. So then how am I saved if it's no? Now, some of you may believe it's yes, then you have it fixed. But if you say it's a no, then, then how am I saved? Well, the Apostle Paul, in another part of uh, his writings, in Romans chapter 1, explains, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, verse 16, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, verse 17, 17, for in it... The righteousness of God, and that's how I translate it, doing the right things or doing the things that God wants you to do. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. From faith to faith. You can equally say from belief to belief. From trust to trust. From faithfulness to faithfulness. As it is written... How is it written? The just shall live by faith or by faithfulness because it's the exact same concept. Does anybody know where Paul is quoting that verse from? Where is it from? It's from the Old Testament. Where in the Old Testament? Book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk is a prophet that in chapter 1 has a lament. He cries out to God. He, he's in a difficult situation. His people is in a scarce situation. And um, because of the distress, because of the pain he's experiencing, because of the challenges that 
exist and seem to be still coming, he says, oh Lord, how long shall I cry? And you will not hear, even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. And God graciously comes to him and says, uh, Habakkuk, you haven't seen anything yet. This is nothing compared to what is coming. You will see how bad it can get. And uh, the prophet again is disturbed and goes back to God and says, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. O Rock, you have marked them for correction, meaning if this is going to happen to my people, if the Babylonians are coming to take us and bring us into exile, that's because of you. You have given them the right to do that. So why don't you do anything? Are you not from everlasting? And when he gets tired, he kind of cools down, sits back, and he says, I'm going to stand here, verse 1 in chapter 2. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. And that's when God comes to him and speaks to him again. And this is what God tells him in chapter 2, verse 4. Chapter 2, verse 4. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him. But the just shall live by, I have a question mark there, fill in the blank. The just shall live by faith. Whose faith? Well, if you will look into your Bible, most trans translations will say, but the just shall live by his faith. But then there is a translation which was the first official translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, done by Jewish rabbis. And you can find the Septuagint, the LXX translation online, translated into current English as well. That's a Greek translation. And this is how the Septuagint translates what God says here. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by my, says God, my faithfulness. Did you get the difference? What God says is with everything going on, with all the difficulties, there is one single way for the just to survive. How, Lord, how? The just shall live by my emuna, faithfulness. Meaning that it is through God's faithfulness or by God's faithfulness that you and I are saved. But there's a certain way how that happens. And we go back now to Paul because he quotes this passage. And by the way, do you know what version of the Bible Paul used among the Gentiles, among the Greeks? The Septuagint. That was, and you can do your research and you will see that the Bible that Paul preached from is the Septuagint version of the Old Testament. Because that was the only widely available translation of the Old Testament in Paul's time. And when Paul says in Romans chapter 1, 17, for in it the righteousness of God, that is, in the gospel, which is the power of God, in it the righteousness of God, or doing the right things of God, is revealed from faith to faith, or from faithfulness to faithfulness, what he says is, yes, this is how righteousness operates. This is how the just shall live by faith. And the way he quotes, he doesn't put there 
whose faith he leaves out the my or the his. He just says the just shall live by faith or by faithfulness. But he indicates how that operates. From faith into faith. Meaning from God being faithful to you into you being faithful to God. So then I'm asking, what faithfulness brings salvation to you? Is it your faithfulness to Him or His faithfulness to you? Yeah, that's, that's the difference. Because it's either my faithfulness or both faithfulnesses, and then I am co-savior, or His faithfulness that generates my faithfulness, and the basis of my salvation is always His faithfulness. Because without His faithfulness, my faithfulness does not even exist. Unless you can realize and admit that God has been faithful to you, there is no way for you to be faithful to Him. And unless you rely on His faithfulness for healing, for salvation... There is no way healing or salvation can ever take place in your life. But again, healing, salvation is real, it's not imaginary. Because there are many Christians today that believe the gospel is like chicken soup for the soul. You have come tired, you sit down, you eat chicken soup for the soul... And then you feel somewhat better go your way. Then in a week or so you come back or maybe for Christmas, for Easter, you eat chicken soup again and you feel somewhat better, you go again. You understand the problem? And salvation or healing is never real. It's just fantasy. When in fact, the teaching of the gospel says, yes, the denouement, the result of what Jesus is doing or has been doing is real salvation, real healing. You know, there's a young man that has been chatting with me for, I don't know, three, four years now. When I first got to know him, he was in a crisis situation. He came to me and told me, Pastor, my wife is threatening that, he, uh, that she will file for divorce. And I asked, uh, what did you wrong? What did you do wrong? Well, pastor, I cheated. I have to admit I cheated. Okay, first thing, stop cheating. You want faithfulness? Faithfulness. From faithfulness into faithfulness. Right? Stop cheating. Okay, I'm going to try, Pastor. He went away. Then after a time, he came back and said, Pastor, it's not getting any better. So I asked, have you stopped cheating? And he said, Pastor, I'm working on it. Uh, faithfulness into faithfulness. It's, it's very hard to work some different ways. Then years passed. And then he came back to me, and he said, Pastor, it's really bad now. She filed for divorce. What happened? Well, I got mad because she cheated on you. Mm. Because she cheated on me. Mm. So now, first you cheated, then she cheated. Yes, Pastor, she did it to me. Why would she do that to me? Why would you do that to her? Have you stopped cheating? Have you cheated on her ever since we spoke? Yeah, Pastor, I have. See the problem? From faithfulness to faithfulness. The problem with our faithfulness relationship, the true faithfulness reality of our life is that we hardly are able to not cheat on God. But He never cheats on us. 
therefore our salvation is in him but again salvation healing is real how do i know well jump at verse 10 jump to verse 10 in ephesians chapter 2 and this is what it says ephesians 2 10 for we are his workmanship created in christ jesus for good works which god prepared beforehand that we should walk in them and now please look at the chiastic structure it started with walking in our dead in our trespasses in our sins and we were doing some works in that condition in that dead or death condition but then we come by grace through faith through faithfulness we are saved and now we do some other works good works prepared beforehand that we should walk in them and that's how you know you are being healed i wanted to illustrate this concept of uh, his workmanship or craftsmanship when i was a child or a youngster i used to create these kind of things like from scratch if you give me a stick a wooden stick and two nails and some wire and some threads and a big bunch of sorghum this is called sorghum i can still manufacture it even if i don't have the machine because normally you have a machine you put this stick in there and and then you you work on it i can still do it using my feet and hand i was manufacturing these to sell them i was making money because in those days it wasn't an abuse to work <laughs> well some people did abuse their children but you could make good money out of this but i usually would manufacture this for a purpose and i would know exactly what you should do with this you can sweep the floor but not any kind of floor and when you remove a spider cob web there's a certain kind of broom that you need longer stick so there were some tricks to it you would manufacture what you would create for a certain purpose of course we are not brooms but god manufactures us he creates us into some things to walk in some things some good works that he prepares for us there are tricks there are specific ways as to how you keep your own being in alignment or in faithfulness with god so this can work this salvation this healing thing can work the device will function and salvation will be real healing will indeed happen I would even explain to people how to store a broom because you cannot store a broom like this if you do that then you will end up having this a deformation and yes because we don't keep in mind what God manufactures us for some of us have deformations instead of doing what god 
has created us for. My point is simple. The gospel is much more than just chicken soup for the soul. You are tired, you come, you take a bowl, you eat a bowl, then you feel better, you go and walk the same kind of walk. No. The walk at the beginning of that chiasm is dead walk. The walk at the end of that chiasm is life walk. By grace, through faithfulness. His grace, His faithfulness. Amen.